I'd like to invite you to join me in welcoming uh, you to very very nice uh, very appreciative of it and also more importantly thank everyone for coming and hosting me um, it's, it's quite an honor to be able to present this work um, at such a, a guest audience as this um, so the work I'm going to be presenting today is on the economic consequences of partisanship in a polarized era um, and as I go through this um, if there's kind of clarifying questions that come up um, you know feel free to ask um, I know, I think the norm in this seminar is to kind of wait for the end, and we'll definitely have some time for more general questions. Um, but as you'll see, this talk is kind of broken up into three segments. And so uh, maybe uh, I'll stop kind of as each segment is done uh, to open it up to see if people have some short questions on that specific segment or any questions. Um, and sometimes, you know, when you see a figure or a table, um, you know, we kind of want to discuss it at that point instead of waiting at the end. So um, I'm more than happy, um, you know, to open it up for questions as we go along, too, um, to stimulate a discussion. Um, so the overview of this project is that when we normally think of politics, we think of, of it in the context of key political components. So, you know, topics on things like parties and candidates, preferences and ideologies, the government and the governed. Um, but a lot of my research, not only on this paper, but in others, is asking the question, does partisanship affect individual and choices in non-political realms? Um, so for example, um, some of my more recent work has examined how politics influences people's choices in choosing mates in online dating sites, right? So how the spillovers of politics um, exudes beyond how we normally think of political decision-making in democracy. And the reason I think that's important is that if you look at kind of political philosophers going back to Aristotle, this is kind of um, a big topic of, that they talked about, of how politics works in contemporary social life. Um, and I think that once we establish some of these empirical regularities, we can get to deeper questions on the feedback loops to how politics affects society and how then that affects politics itself. And maybe some of these reinforcing patterns are kind of damaging for having a society that works well when um, it comes to solutions to problems. Um, the other nice thing about this topic is I started working on it a long time ago, um, but the real world has actually kind of justified the importance, um, which is always nice than actually doing the opposite, where you kind of start with real world um, inspiration, and then it becomes kind of stale by the time you're done with the project. Um, so some stories you might have heard in the news um, you know, the top one is there's been a lot of discussion of Ivanka Trump's brand as uh, sort of a political football. Um, so prior to her father's run for the presidency, um, I'm not an expert on this, but you know, her brand was kind of like high-end but not really high-end products um, in many ways, kind of like what the Trump brand is generally about. <laughs> um, uh, but it was a very successful brand. It was placed in a lot of stores, and so there's been discussions that maybe this brand is being hurt by the political affiliations, but oftentimes maybe some people are even that's being helped, too, um, that her brand has been increasing in popularity on Amazon. Um, after the Trump travel ban, um, Uber decided to not surge price, therefore essentially breaking the strike of the taxi workers at JFK. Um, and so then a lot of people had a social media campaign to delete Uber from their phones um, because of the political um, uh, ramifications of that decision. And then on the other side, Howard Schultz, the CEO of Starbucks, has gotten into some trouble both by being kind of anti-Trump and more pro-globalist, as well as saying that refugees are welcome to the United States and that he was going to hire them. And there was a campaign on the right to boycott Starbucks. Um, so all of these stories basically have this common theme where these are economic decisions people are making that should not really, that politics shouldn't really have any relevance for, right? Um, so, um, you know, I'm trying to buy a good pair of shoes that I like, I just want to buy some coffee, I'm trying to get home from the airport. These are economic transactions. Yet, in all of these three cases, at least some of the media coverage has suggested that politics is infecting a lot of the economic choices that people are making. We don't have really great data on that, but if this is true, this potentially reflects some problems. Because the increased polarization in American society, we know is problematic for things like gridlock and getting things done. And you know, I understand I'm not in the United States right now, but this is also true. Uh, a lot of people around the country, world, including populist revolts in Europe, are, are experiencing this problem as well. Um, but this is moving it further to say maybe there's even more deeper consequences if economic transactions themselves are distorted um, by political disagreements. 
Um, so what we're going to try to do in this paper is experimentally examine whether partisan considerations affect people's behavior in a range of contexts. And I think what makes this research unique compared to a lot of research in this literature is that we're going to look at cases where clear pecuniary or professional gains are at stake. Um, so is it that really just that someone will say they don't like Starbucks? Or will they actually say, I'm not going to enjoy this drink I've been liking for a long time um, because of some political signal that I'm getting? Or I hate wearing high heels, but I'll wear Ivanka's high heels because I want to support President Trump. Right? Um, now, this extends a lot of research that really focuses on partisanship and, pol and partisan polarization solely in terms of sort of ideological issues or policy issues. Um, so there's a big disagreement in that between people like Abramowitz and people like Fiorina. We're building on that literature, but we're going to move outside the political con uh, context into the economic domain. Um, so if I'm saying what literature does this really tap onto well, I would say there's two main schools of literature. So one is this literature really started by um, Shanto Iyengar and his colleagues, um, which has developed this idea of affective polarization, which I think moved the literature on polarization in a very new, interesting direction away from just focusing on issues. Because um, if we read all the back and forth on partisan polarization in the United States, there's a lot of d disagreements on whether we should be looking at these seven-point scales or five-point scales and whether a six means something or a five means something. And Iyengar basically said, okay, well, let's step back and say, well, it seems like what, what we're really talking about is not necessarily gradations on issues, because most people don't have very strong <coughs> issue positions anyway or know much about issues. But really what's going on is that people are increasingly disliking and distrusting supporters of the other party. So as I'll discuss in a second, this literature, I think its main limitation is that most of everything that's going on in these papers is in the context of a survey. Um, and so we want to kind of understand what the scope conditions are. Do some of these results extend beyond the survey context? The other literature I think this taps into is the effects of partisanship on economic perceptions. Um, so some of these are measured in surveys. Uh, for example, whether partisanship colors people's opinions of the unemployment rate or how the unemployment rate is going to change. Um, but Gerber and Huber actually have a paper in 2009 that I think is similar to this paper, although ours is a bit different. So their paper basically shows that when the, basically the party of the president changes, um, that individuals in those areas buy more stuff um, because they have, um, or less stuff, um, because they have more optimistic forecasts. So it's not just that people are just in cheap talk saying they have more consumer confidence, but they argue that they actually do have more consumer confidence. Um, this paper actually has been challenged. Um, there's a recent paper in the QJPS kind of arguing that paper wasn't right, the original APSR paper. Um, so I think it's like a debated issue, which is actually more of a reason why we should have another study um, that's somewhat similar on this topic. Um, so as I mentioned, you know, I think a lot of the limitations of prior research um, is about would this actually have external validity outside the survey context. Um, so what does that specifically mean? Well, I think there's two main problems. So one is that the survey responses could be just expressive responding or cheap talk. Um, so when you say, for example, that I dislike the other party or rate them low on a feeling thermometer, what does that actually mean? So what Bullock and all um, show in their paper um, is that, for example, a lot of the Bartels type effects that Republicans think that the unemployment rate is higher under a Democratic president than a Democratic president, those effects get smaller if you pay people to provide a response. Right? And the argument is, is that once you pay people, the incentive for expressive responding goes down. Um, so that's a very nice result, and it actually makes us question um, some of the results that we see in surveys. Um, I think another problem is, is that even when responses are incentivized, you might think there are still Hawthorne effects. So you could imagine that you could um, replicate some of these cheap talk responses and put more money into the situation or more stakes, but people still believe that they're being monitored by researchers um, and may think that it may act accordingly. Um, so this was actually a big thing that spurned uh, my online dating work um, because one nice thing about the online dating context is that people are kind of behaving as if they're not being watched, even though they are. Um, and so that's a nice thing about kind of the internet world and online world generally um, is that people are not that paranoid yet um, about all of their activities being monitored. And so they can still behave as they are in an, in an ecological setting. Um, so again, we're just looking at basically the scope conditions is that are we going to find these results hold up? 
in more natural settings without monitoring. Um, so I'm going to show you the um, results from three studies. So the first study, um, and the point of all these studies is to look at different facets of economic behavior. Um, so the first study is going to look at a field experiment in an online labor market. So a big economic decision people make is who to work for. Um, the second one is a field experiment on consumer behavior, which is more similar to some of the motivating examples. Um, and we're also going to replicate this in an online marketplace. So that's kind of two studies baked into that one. And then the third one is going to be an incentivized population-based survey experiment. Um, and this one is you know, being monitored, but it is heavily incentivized. And it's a very high quality sample that's representative, um, whereas the first two studies are kind of may, um, are not as representative. Um, and so the goal is to um, also point out that it's very hard in field experiments to test out theoretical mechanisms um, because you don't really have a lot of individual access and you can only measure a few outcome variables. Um, and also the statistical power issues means that it's not like you can cross a bunch of cells to get some sort of design-based inference. Um, so I'm going to be talking about the theoretical mechanisms, um, but the main goal of this paper is to really just evaluate the scope of the affective polarization literature. And we can talk about maybe ways in future work that some of the mechanisms can be teased out. But um, at least for this purposes, I think the mechanisms themselves are not as important as the overall treatment effects. The last thing I'll mention is that for all of these studies, we filed at least some form of a pre-analysis plan. Um, and there's going to be inevitable logistical deviations from these plans, but we basically stuck with them. Um, so all the results I'm going to show you were pre-registered. So um, study number one. So the first study um, is we asked people to help us copy edit a website for grammatical and typographical mistakes. Um, so this job was advertised on Amazon's Mechanical Turk. So Mechanical Turk is normally used by political scientists to conduct surveys, but most of the stuff that goes on Mechanical Turk is not surveys. It's regular contract work. Um, so this is actually a typical sort of job, this kind of editing type job. Um, and so $3 might not seem like a lot of money, but the implied hourly wage is actually closer to $12, um, which is pretty high, and I think also it's more like this is a real thing that people were doing for real money. Um, so when they clicked on the link to complete our task, we had people answer a brief questionnaire. Um, and subjects were told that the reason we were asking this information was to learn more about the diversity of our employees. And so we asked um, questions about what their education was, what their editing experience was, their age and gender. And we slipped in um, a question about their partisan affiliation. And so the goal was to sort of unobtrusively embed this within the questionnaire. And this is important because this allowed us to condition on partisanship at the individual level, um, which whenever you're doing a study of descriptive differences between partisans, you kind of need to do that. Otherwise, you're going to get a zero effect as you know, Democrats and Republicans cancel each other out with opposite sign treatment effects. Um, so they were showed about one page of text. And they were told, we're launching a website soon for a software company. This is some text that's going to be on the website, and so you need to edit it. Um, so everybody got the same text, but they were kind of told, well, here's just some text from the website. Um, so the text is where the randomly assigned treatment is embedded. And the treatment signals the partisanship of the software company's founders. So in the control condition, the text says that the founders developed their software while working for a nonprofit organization. In the treatment condition, it says they were either um, developed it while they were working for the Democratic Party or the Republican Party on their fundraising efforts. So the goal of the treatment is to not say, um, oh, this is like a Republican company or something like that. But it's to say, in a normal political interaction, this is some way how partisanship might be signaled to people, right? Which is, this is a company that has nothing to do with politics, but this is something about the background of the founder, right? So it could be analogous to something like this founder also donates money to the organization or something. But it's something separate from what the organization is doing. Um, and what we did is we put 11 grammatical or spelling errors purposely inserted into various parts of the document. Okay? So then we have three outcome variables. So the first one is, is that we ask people to state their reservation wage. So this is how much they would require to take another similar job from us in the future. So reservation wage is a really great variable because it, it automatically ties to economic theories about compensating differentials. So compensating differentials 
are just basically any wage difference somebody might take um, in order to get some differential part of the job, right? So a classic example of a compensating differential is that um, if you do construction work on a highway, you get paid like way more than if you don't do construction work on a highway because you're putting your own life at risk. And so there has to be some differential. So the question is, is there analogous differentials for working for someone for the opposite political beliefs or the same political beliefs? Um, we also record the number of errors the subject caught out of the 11 errors to see what the quality of work they were producing. And we also looked at effort um, to record how many total corrections that were caught. So a lot of these people thought that our original thing was not written as well as it should have. So they, in addition to correcting things that were clearly wrong, they had various opportunities to improve in wordsmith the language as well. So we thought that's a good outcome variable um, to look at as well. So that was um, also something we predicted. So this is a look what the tasks look like on Mechanical Turk. So this is the website they were supposed to read. And then at the bottom, they have a text box to list all the different errors. And we have some programming code that goes through that to actually catch how many errors that they correctly caught, as well as the total number. So the way the actual treatment looks is that it's mentioned in two different spots in the document. So one is, it says, our founders, Chris and Matt, met as committed <coughs> volunteers working for Republican campaigns, Democratic campaigns, or nonprofit organizations in Michigan. And then after their successful efforts working for the Republicans, the Democrats, they're nonprofits. So it was signaled twice the partisanship. So with the, the reservation wage, the theoretical mechanism is very clear um, on the compensating differential, as I mentioned. Now for the errors, this is where it gets a little bit more complicated and where I think experiments like this get a little bit tougher to sometimes analyze the results. Um, so it could be that people might shirk when faced with um, um, a, a same employer because they expect less scrutiny. Um, or they might say that, well, maybe if there's the co-partisan, they are of higher quality, and therefore I'm expecting fewer errors, and that's why I'm catching less. Um, or it could be the reverse direction, that animus might lead people to sort of sabotage work of people they don't dislike. Um, so, and if all of these things are going on, you might get a zero effect because you have sort of offsetting effects. So I think with the reservation wage, the effects are very clear. For the errors, it's a little bit more uncertain um, what actually might happen. Okay, so in terms of the descriptive statistics, um, they turned out pretty nice. So the reservation wage is a little bit higher than the original task, which is kind of what we would normally expect when you're negotiating with somebody. The errors caught are in the middle range, which is exactly what we wanted, because you don't want it too near the ceiling, because then you can't um, detect the differences. Um, so we had some very hard errors to detect and some very easy ones, so that was a nice uh, thing. And the total corrections were a little bit higher than the errors caught, um, which was also kind of sensible and good. Um, the other thing I'll mention is, is that the nice thing about total corrections, too, is that you get more dispersion and more variance to explain, because um, some people have different levels of quality and how much work they're doing and time they're spending on this. Um, okay, so here are the results. Um, so the big, I think, strong effect that's very consistent um, is this effect on the wage. Um, so what we generally find is that the, if you're working for a co-partisan employer relative to the control group, um, you ask for 22 cents less. Um, than if you're working for the nonpartisan employer. So you're getting a compensating differential. You're giving somebody a discount because they share your partisan identity. On the other hand, there's actually no difference um, between the counterpartisan effects and the control group. So it's not like you're punishing the opposite party employer um, in order to, to work for them. So this is actually like in pretty stark contrast to a lot of the literature on affective polarization. So I'll get to that in the end and why we might be finding differences. But it kind of like does give you a different flavor of the results. So we are seeing some partisan effects, but most of them are driven by in-group love rather than out-group animus. When you're basically putting a task where it's not obvious that someone is participating in a study and they're behaving as they would in a naturalistic context. Um, the effects on the errors in total edits are a bit more noisy, but um, the direction is there, right? You can still see the direction. And in this case, you actually find the shirking effect, right? Which is if you're working for the co-partisan, you actually do a worse job on the task. Um, so you're asking for less money, but you're also not doing as um, good work. And so that could be um, because they think that the person is of higher quality, um, but it also could be a shirking effect that they expect maybe lower um, monitoring or scrutiny. 
Um, and again, there's no effects on the counterpartisan um, treatment. Um, now, how big are these effects? I think the education experience variables, when you have models controlling for them, can kind of give you a sense of that. And they're actually very, very big, okay? So education is measured on a six-point scale. So for every level of education, the person is asking for six more cents. So that's what we would expect. So that co-partisan effect is over three times the effect of one category of education. So we ask editing experience on a four-point scale. So as you'd expect, every additional um, uh, scale point they move on experience, they're asking for 16 cents more. So that's pretty comparable to the effect of copartisanship. So the core thing that should determine the reservation wage, which is what is the quality of the employee, the political effects are on par with those kind of effects. So I think in terms of effect sizes, that's pretty substantial. So I'll just summarize the results, and maybe we can stop there before we go on to the next study, see if people have any questions. But essentially, we find that workers do behave differently when they believe their employer shares their partisan affiliation. And all of these effects of these studies seem to be driven by affinity towards in-party members rather than animus towards the out-party. So wages by a same party partisan go down about 6.5% relative to an unlabeled employer. This effect size compared to the whole range of experience is about half the size and about 75% of the whole range of education. Um, and workers do seem to shirk when employed by a co-partisan, um, but those effects on the shirking are a bit weaker and less precise, um, but they still seem to be there. So I'll stop there and see if people have any questions. Yep. Yeah, so that's what these two do. Um, so the two do it di kind of in different ways. So this one was nonprofit, the first one, uh, just to match the first one. And this one was um, just a fundraiser. Yeah, just a fundraiser. So that was more similar to, you don't know what you're raising funds for. But you think about the process of not saying anything. Oh, at all. Just, uh, just do the, the mar yeah. So then you're, you're changing a few other things, because then you don't have the backstory in some ways, right? Um, and then in the first one, for example, what you're changing is you're not, you're changing the background of the, the founder, right? Um, so yeah, I think those would be great replications because they um, strip out whether there's some positive aspect of nonprofit or something like that. Um, the nice thing about this current design, though, is that at least those differences are going to be constant across the Democrat and Republican conditions, right? So like um, when you're, you know, at least the comparisons to the control group is the same, right? Because you're having the same control group. The question, though, is that, is that overall difference is going to be biased up or down because people have positive affinity. It could be. Then the trade-off is, is that you're changing multiple things in the, the design. Um, so I guess our decision was this is kind of the trade-off we'd like to make. But yeah, I think that would be great future work to see maybe the effects are too small because there's a positive attribute. Or but it's nonprofit, especially leftist. Not necessarily, I don't think. Um, I mean, there's, I mean, there's like religious nonprofits, for example, that you know try to stop abortions or things like that. So um, it can go either way. The question, though, is that the, is the word nonprofit because it's like against profit itself, <laughs> like kind of have a have a positive con connotation. Some people it might, to some people, it, you know, it could. Um, so if you imagine, like, if the let's say like the response rates are just higher in the nonprofit condition. You could say, well, did that um, cook the results in some ways because you then find bigger differences against the control group? Um, it could have. You could argue it's the opposite way because you're like, oh, there's two positive things you're providing, the partisanship and the nonprofits and other partisanship. So I guess our view was it's unclear what direction the bias would go, whereas my experience is that people really don't like it when you start changing multiple things across conditions because then they say, oh, well, you're doing compound treatments and things like that. So that's the decision we made. But yeah, I would love it if people replicated to say, oh, well, if you did nothing, that would assuage my concerns about the bias being in one direction. I'm just curious about, uh, I'm not sure if you can track my crisis, but like the click-through rate. It seems that uh, you control the thickness of the market to an extent, but the actual views on the page would be relevant for the analysis. 
And I would love to get that data. Yeah. So okay. So so in the Canadian, like the Canadian equivalent, PGG does it. Yeah. Like where you can see the, but it doesn't it doesn't. Oh, okay. No. So basically, we yeah we don't know the the number of clicks. Um, I mean, all we really have. I mean, we're getting even the the thickness in kind of a backdoor way by scraping the, all of the things to get a sense of how thick the market is. But yeah. I was just wondering, uh, I think you said that in, in both your studies um, there was a, a positive bias in the sense that the Republicans would be more likely to buy from the, the Republicans, but not a negative in the sense that um, if they were opposite parties, you didn't see much yeah. of an effect. Um, I was just wondering, can, can you speculate why that yeah. would be the case? Obviously, that goes beyond the study itself. That's a, so I have some of that on the end. Okay. Um, I think that's a general question that I think are some... I have some speculations on it. So the difficult, I, so when, especially when you look at the third study, it sheds some light on that. So one issue with this is like, you know, when you have three studies, kind of you have three data points in some ways, and then you're trying to say, okay, well, if there's differences in the studies, how do we learn from that? And so it's a bit difficult, but I'll speculate on, on that at the end. The reason why I brought it up in terms of this is because, like, obviously you're getting $50 for $25. It's an amazing deal. Yes. And, but only 2% said yes. So yeah. there's clearly, um, in, in your population to begin with, there's a huge level of distrust. So you could speculate that the affinity leads you to marginally overcome that distrust. Yeah, so you know, that could be true. I mean, I would say that there's general distrust in almost any population of, I think, email solicitation. So if you compare that, that 2.1% is humongous in the digital marketing literature. They, like, nobody finds that. Um, like something that large. And I think the reason you're finding it that large is because the deal is pretty good, right. um, among other reasons, like kind of universities being signaled and things like that, you know. Um, but yeah, I think that could be true. Um, and so I think the questions, I think, are, are these populations kind of strange enough that, um, like the Mechanical Turk and this population, that this is why you're finding this direction of the effect? It could be. The only way we would know is to try to do more studies with more diverse populations. Why I say that is because, like, let's say you might have the exact same effect if you were a black person buying from a black group. There might yeah. be more trust because of the affinity. Yes. Or a Protestant buying from a Protestant group. Yes. Or, 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 or you could put 50 different categories that it's not necessarily partisan. It's just, oh, this is something more like me, and so I trust them a little more, and that's the key effect. I, yeah, so I, I don't disagree with anything you said. So I think one big question is, is like, well, why is this different from other group affiliations? So there's two responses to that. So one, you could say, well, it's not, but we're political scientists, and so this is an important thing for us to study. Um, so there's substantive reasons why this is a particular group affiliation. Um, I mean, we could do something with like hair color too, um, but maybe that's less of an important research question, whereas things like race and partisanship are important research questions. Um, the second thing I would say is, is that theoretically, I think you would think that partisanship would have stronger effects in some ways, so both stronger and weaker. So, in terms of like in the experiments, they could have stronger effects because there's not really norms against discriminating on this variable like there are with race. Um, but in the real world, you could say there'd be weaker effects because it's something easier to hide than something like race. Um, so I think it actually is substantively and qualitatively different than some of the other things you're talking about. Um, but I think the third study will be interesting to you um, because it will get a lot of these things about kind of compare to what. Um, and then the downside of the third study is that it's in, in a survey, but this is where we can get a little bit more leverage. Um, so I'll move on to the third study. Okay, so the third study is we wanted to have a survey experiment that was unique from other survey experiments in that we wanted participants to bear some direct cost for their partisan behavior. So there's just really no, I mean, it's similar to the Bullock et al. That's like a very close paper to this, but um, so it's in that literature, but most papers don't do things like this, right? So most of the times when you're studying affective polarization, you're just asking people, what is the unemployment rate? What is your feeling thermometer? You know, would you marry someone of the opposite party? You know, would you want your kids to do so? Would you want to be friends with them? They're just, you know, survey responses. There's, you know, there's no cost for answering the question. Um, so what we want to do is basically give respondents an explicit choice between two rewards at the conclusion of the survey. So if they accept the higher reward, a donation is going to be made to the opposite party. And these donations were actually made. Um, so there's no deception in the study. So they have to weigh their distaste for the other party against their own material gain. And so are people going to suffer materially 
in order to express this partisan animus, right? Um, so this was administered by GFK. It's a big sample, so over 3,000 people. Um, and it's also a very, very high quality sample. So GFK is not really people who are opting in, clicking on battery ads or Mechanical Turk or anything like that, take the survey. They're recruited via RDD and address-based methods and then enter the online panel. Um, so it's generally considered very, very good quality data. Um, so the key survey question was asked at the end. So we asked them to you know, have a few questions. Um, some of the questions were important for the study, some were more like dummy questions. Um, but we said, as an additional thank you for filling out the questionnaire, we'd like to give you a bonus cash payment. You can choose one of the two options below. You can have a $3 payment to us as a thank you. Um, so this is actually a lot of money, given that the, basically the reward they get for taking the survey is about a dollar from GFK. So you're saying, I'm giving you three times the wage you took just to do the survey. So option B is a $6 payment as a thank you, and the researchers will make a separate $4 donation to the Democratic or Republican National Committee, the opposite party of what your party is, an organization that helps Republicans or Democrats get elected to office. So this is, we gave them this um, matrix so they know exactly what the deal is. So there's four experimental conditions. So the baseline is just what I showed you, $3 versus $6 plus the donation to the opposite party. So we want to say, okay, well, compared to what? So one idea is that there's this minimal group paradigm in social psychology, which is you can divide people up into any group and they exhibit this kind of behavior. I think that's what you're kind of alluding to. So they do something like, what's the last digit of your social security number? Is it odd or even? Um, they randomly give people like blue placards in the lab or red placards and divide them up into groups. And they find, you find a lot of these effects, even with these random groups, right? So we say, okay, one group that we can talk about that's kind of minimal is uh, a donation to an organization building a project east or west of the Mississippi River. Um, so we know whether they're east or west of the Mississippi River. And so based on this geography, we can say, would you want to donate to this organization that's just in a different geographical location than you? Um, so notice, this is just west and east of the river. It's not like in a city or a coast or anything like that. You know? um, and then another thing you might ask is like religion, um, as was alluded to. So you could say, okay, this is like a meaningful comparison. So this is a cleavage we know exists in society. So how does partisanship compare to that? Um, so would you like to have a $6 and a donation to um, a Christian or atheist organization? So we looked at Christians and atheists and how they responded to that. And then we also had one condition uh, with elasticity. Um, so uh, $3 versus uh, $9 plus a donation to the opposite party. So the nice results I'll show you is that this is pretty inelastic. So we actually, you know, we didn't have the number of questions to do something like a Becker de Groot thing to get like the full elasticity curve. But given that we have two points and it's pretty flat, that's a good sign that results ended up pretty good. Um, and then we had a bunch of pretreatment moderators that we need to do this, right? Like partisanship, what the religion is, the geographic location, all that kind of stuff. Um, so again, you, know, you can imagine there's these two theoretical mechanisms. It could be animus. Um, maybe it's like strategic partisan behavior that, oh, this money is actually going to help the party get elected. I think the amounts are low enough that it really is animus and not the second effect that's going on. Um, so I, I find this result pretty amazing. Um, which is that 75% of the people um, in the full sample would rather take less money to avoid helping the other party. Um, so this is basically three free dollars and they don't want it because they know that more money is going to go to the opposite party. So I just think that's like very, very large. Um, now in, you might say, oh, well, maybe this is because people just don't like donating money to any political cause. So we did a follow-up study on Mechanical Turk where we said, okay, well, you can have the higher payment, but we're also going to donate to your own party, right? So this gets at whether people are just opposed of um, giving political giving per se. So only 15% of people accepted the smaller payment. So even if you adjusted all these results by 15 percentage points, I think they're still pretty dramatic. Um, that's very similar to what you find in the religion condition. So that was 77%, so there's no statistical difference between those. So partisanship is about as large of a cleavage um, as religion. And then we would hope that the geography effects would be a lot smaller, and they are significantly smaller. Um, when we kind of condition this on strong and weak partisanship, so among strong partisans, 89% um, don't want to give the extra money. 
So that is kind of what you would expect. Um, but I think it's amazing that even among weak and leaning partisans, you still find that 69% um, don't want the extra money to avoid helping the opposite party. Um, so these are statistically significant differences too. And then one way you kind of know the experiment is working kind of properly and we're actually getting at the effects of partisanship is that this difference is significantly larger than the difference of religion, right? So um, partisanship is uniquely conditioning the effect when you have the partisanship treatment and not the religion treatment. And also, to make sure the experiment is working properly, we hope that the difference in the geography condition was about zero, and it was, right? We wouldn't expect partisanship to condition that. Um, if you want to see this in a regression form, this is what it looks like, but you know, I think the main results are kind of like what, what it is. But this kind of gets you the sense of, well, you know, the difference in difference between the religion and partisan strength is large, significant, et cetera. Okay, so now on the elasticity, we find that um, the baseline rate, again, is about 75%. If you say to people, okay, I'm not going to give you $6. Let's see how far we can push you. We'll give you $9. It doesn't drop that much. It only goes down to 71%. Um, now, that is statistically significantly different. But if you look at what the implied elasticity is, it's an inelastic effect, right? The elasticity is only 0.07. So we did a bunch of robustness checks on this, too. So, um, this is not due to the priming of partisanship. Um, so you might think that, oh, well, we asked about partisanship, and then you make them do something about partisanship. So we did other studies where we asked about partisanship after, um, but you have some profile variables on partisanship, and it doesn't matter what order you do it in. The effects are basically exactly the same. You might think that, um, well, maybe there's some instrumental motivations here, too. Like, if people take their own money, they're going to then give some of that money to their own party. So um, we also did something where we gave people an option to donate to their own party and to the other party to see how much of this was instrumental. So it explains some of the effect, but not all of it. Um, so it can't just be um, pure instrumental motivations. Um, so in terms of the summary of this third study, this is one where we actually are really mainly looking at the outgroup animus. Right? And this is that we're actually finding the effect of that. Um, so I'm going to, at the end, I'm going to talk about maybe why that's different between the two studies, one, two, and three. Um, but for now, that's kind of what the, the effects are. Um, and so this affects kind of real economic decision making. The effects are as large as religious affiliation. And it's not simply limited to the strong partisans. So it's, it is larger among strong partisans. We see that in all the studies. Um, but it's large even among those who have a loose attachment to the parties. Um, so I'm going to stop there on study three. So I'll ask, see if people have questions on study three specifically. Then I'll just have a few concluding comments and we can have a more general discussion. Yeah, yeah so I'm wondering, how often is there any kind of bonus payment uh, in, in, uh, uh, on that uh, is similar to the one you're offering? Very rarely. Um, and the reason we were able to do this is that this was like a special test competition uh, where they were offering these bonus payments. Um, so normally, the survey firms kind of don't like doing this because it interferes with their regular payment structure for their panelists. Um, and they also don't like the idea of some people getting paid more than others. That's like kind of, they don't like that for their panelists. Like it upsets them if they find out about it. Um, but this was like a very special exception because of this test thing. So, so, so you said that uh, the incentive could be seen as quite large because it's three times or six times what people typically get, I'm sorry, no, typically get one dollar, but you could see your incentive as like a one-time deal, and in the grand scale of things, an extra three dollars is not, it's not a massive incentive yeah. compared to the overall uh, weekly or uh, annual income. Um, so I'm wondering if it could be different if, um, say somebody enters that platform and knows that there's a lot of bonuses, and would say, every time there's a bonus, I take it, whatever happens. Yeah, so we so, did this also on Mechanical Turk, in one of the, in this priming replication. So mechanical Turk is very different, where people are getting bonuses all the time. There's a whole system for giving bonuses on mechanical Turk. Um, and in that, you do see some effects. So the intercepts do shift up a little bit, um, but mainly the effects are very similar overall on mechanical Turk. Um, you know, it's hard to know what to make of that, because you're confounding a lot of things there. You know, mechanical Turk also just has a bunch of weird people who just like making a lot of money. Um, but it also has this kind of multiple repeated bonus payment effect. 
Yeah, so uh, let's say to, to map it into like a decision about which job to take if you want to work for a Republican employer to a Democrat. Yeah. Um, that that. So let's say you're facing most job opportunities that are counterpartisan, but getting a job gives you an income for the whole year, for example. While saying no to an extra three dollars doesn't really affect, or six dollars doesn't really affect anything. Yeah. So that, then you can tie this to study one a little bit too. Um, so I mean, those are kind of some complaints about study one you could have, which is we try to have it a system where there is repeated game play. Um, but at the end of the day, this is not like really shining up for a full-time job, right? So the stakes are a lot lower, and so maybe that these you would have a stronger chance of finding the effects. So yeah, I mean, I, I, all I can say is like kind of the next study, you'd have to like work with a corporation or something to, and I think those kind of, you have to imagine like how would you really do those studies? And moreover, is it actually kind of like should you be doing those studies on those things that are such high stakes, right? Which is you know people's actual employment choices rather than doing contract work. Um, so yeah, so I think that's a question of external validity. Um, and in some ways, I think it makes the, some of the null effects, I think, more like, all right, these are kind of clear nulls because um, we're making like, the best chance possible um, to make the decision low enough stakes, okay. right? Yeah. Yeah. I'm just curious, you mentioned the instrumental effect. When, when, was, when was it conducted? Like, was it during an electoral event or nearby? Or? Yeah, was pretty, this, this follow-up was pretty near the 2016 election. Yeah, so yeah. there might be some sort of instrumental effect. I, don't, I mean, yeah. the findings are still quite strong. So, but. Yeah, exactly. So I think that would even be an overestimate of the experimental effect since the main study was done like very far from an election. I think it was like 2015. Um, and when the follow-ups were like 2016 in the election year, so that could explain it as well. Um, so one kind of tricky thing with all of this is like, you want to kind of replicate and refine the studies and do robustness checks, but then like the world change in our line of work, the world changes a lot when you're kind of doing the experiments in a sequential fashion, um, as opposed to like a lot of social psychology research where the context is less important than what we do, you know. So. Uh, we only look at two. So it was, um, yeah, so it was Christians and atheists. And so the, the donation was either to the Christian Legal Society or like um, an organization so for promoting atheist causes. Individual. Causes. individual. Because you, you relate that to the religion or religiosity of the individuals, don't you? Yes, that's right. And what kind of information do you have? Oh, just their religious like identity. So it's like you know we give them a choice of religions. Like what you know what religious religion best uh, do you most identify with? I forget the exact question wording. And there was a nun or yeah yeah there was ag agnostic and atheist as options. Okay, but you don't you didn't have intensity. No, we uh, we do to to be honest we have like the church attendance. Um, so obviously the atheists and agnostics are all constant on that. But yeah we could do this heterogeneity by like number of attendance of. Of, of Christians, yeah. We have the data for that, for sure. Um, okay, so I'll do some overall conclusions and then we can open up for more general discussion. Um, so I think you know, what we're trying to get at in this paper is that I think politics has become an extended feature of people's social identities um, and it does influence and shape their behavior seemingly unrelated to politics, including their economic interactions. Um, so I think our effect sizes are more modest than what the peer survey based studies find, um, but they're there. And in some ways I think that's useful because I think it's like a lot of these survey based studies I think have been really, I think, overstating all the effects, but I think their general thrust is in the right direction. Um, and I think we can also differentiate in-group favoritism from out-group animus. A lot of previous research doesn't do that or they just assume that we're going to be looking at out-group animus. Um, and we actually find that in-group favoritism sometimes does dominate the out-group animus. I would also point out that a lot of these effects are, are pretty big. Um, in you know, and so in study one, the effects of the reservation wage and the task performance are comparable to the effects of education and experience. In study two, co-partisanship doubles the purchasing rates. And in study three, 75% of people give up money. Even among weak and leading partisanships, the percentage is well above 50%. These are big effects. Um, but I still think there's some open questions. And I think like, this is the big open question, is that 
why, what is explaining the heterogeneity in the in-group love and the out-group animus? So why are you not finding it? So I have an argument for why that's the case. I don't have like proof or data because we only have really three studies. So it's not like we have that much degrees of freedom to address this. But I think what it really comes down to is sort of the saliency of the choice in the lab versus the field. So in the study one and two are field studies, right? So partisanship is not really like the salient thing um, that's going on in the choice. It's not very clear to people that they're part of a political experiment, that's what's going on. So in that case, you could imagine that, well, you know, what, what really is is I kind of have more affinity towards people like me and that's how I relate um, in normal life. But if you're kind of in a survey, and the survey is clearly about politics, and you've been asked questions about politics, and you're given an explicit decision on the table, like do you want the money or do you not want the money, well that might invite a lot of outgroup thinking, because that's kind of what the survey is doing. So one thing it does raise questions about is when we kind of move forward and are like, do we want to do the field studies? Do we want to survey studies? I think we want to do both. They're both very important and they're great. Um, but one thing we want to, um, you know, um, one, one thing we kind of um, want to, you know, be aware of is that I, I think it, when we ask people surveys about politics, people are just immediately put in the mind of politics. That that's what I'm supposed to be thinking about, that's how I'm gonna behave. But in the real world, a lot of people are not thinking about that in their data interactions. So that's why I think asking surveys about political questions and topics is the right way to do it. Because you know, the diff distinction between a survey question and going in the voting booth and voting, there may not be a big distinction there. right? So maybe that is kind of mimicking that process very well. But if you're asking about stuff outside the survey context, oftentimes the survey itself might kind of prime people in that direction. Um, so that's why kind of in the other work I was doing on online dating, it's very important to get kind of field data. Because, yeah, it's true when you ask people explicitly, do you want to date people of opposite parties, the act of asking that question might be more likely to say that. But if people are unobtrusively acting on that way in their own lives, you don't know if that's the case. So that would be, that's at least what I know, but I don't, I, I'm not very confident in that. So that's why I think the next step is just for more and more replications to be done. Um, and I hope at least this paper provides kind of like a machinery or an archetype um, to do a lot of these studies and to kind of see if some of these effects replicate and kind of move a lot of this literature outside the survey context a bit. Um, so thanks so much, I appreciate it, and um, I guess we have 15 minutes left for more general discussion. <laughs>